you know, having the hands-on experience as well as helping us develop as we go forward. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we got people from 54 states and it looks like three European countries today. So we've got a huge uh, attendance from all over the world. So thanks everybody for showing up. Um, we're going to move through it pretty quickly, but we will try and uh, you know, keep it open at the end for some questions. And uh, of course, we'll have our voting for our Cluffy Excellence at the end too. So everybody, uh, hang in there with us if we run a second or two late. So you stay on. So. References for today, um, Hydronics, as you know, is one of the best resources in the industry for information on anything hydronics. And we have covered thermostatic valves a couple different times in issues, and you can see there on the screen, uh, number seven, we talked about mixing and hydronic systems specifically. And then number 11 that we did here a couple of years ago, we tried to um, talk more about the domestic water applications. And both of them are excellent references. A lot of the slides that we're using today come out of these issues. So if you don't have these, by all means, go to our website and sign up, and we'll mail them to you. And of course, we can uh, furnish some back issues if you want these and you missed them. So, um, and here's what we've got out so far. So we're up to number 16 on the streets as we speak. Um, those are some of the ones that if, you don't, if you're missing them, you know, look over that list and uh, let us know. We'll help you out with that. Uh, 17 will be out probably June or July. We're looking at um, uh, buffer tanks, you know, so that'll be our next topic, and then maybe water quality after that. So what we ask with these is, as always, you know, any ideas that you have for future issues, we want to hear from you um, out in the field there, the engineers, the wholesalers, and installers. What can we do to help you? Because uh, we're here to serve. So thanks for the input. All right, so today's topic, we're going to look at the different types of mixing valves, thermostatic mixing valves, what's unique and different about Coleffi, and we've got the best person I can think of to uh, answer all those questions and go through it. So thanks, Kevin, for doing the heavy lifting and being here today, and it's, uh, it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Bob. I appreciate it. So today we'll be covering a bunch of topics, uh, namely, you know, how does a Coleffi thermostatic mixing valve actually work, um, how to select the right one for your specific project or application, and what we need to know about installation, uh, service, and use, and uh, maintaining and troubleshooting. So we'll try and cover a wide variety of topics. And uh, as we go through this, please send your questions in, and we'll, uh, we'll capture all those and, and get to them at the end of the broadcast. So here we go. Let's start off with a definition. Uh, what is a thermostatic mixing valve? Uh, so it's a self-contained, thermostatically operated modulating valve. And uh, self-contained means there's no wires. It's all, it's all contained within itself. Thermostatically means that it has a, a thermostatic element inside that does all the control and does the modulating. So uh, that's not the same as a motorized mixing valve. A motorized mixing valve does, does not have a thermostat, and it has wires and requires a controller and separate sensors. And Coleffi makes both thermostatic mixing valves and motorized mixing valves. We just wanted to, to define those here. And uh, basically, uh, there are two functions. The first one is regulating hot water supply to a distribution system, and there are a number of ways to do that, and we'll, we'll look at some of those. Another is maintaining inlet temperature to a, convention, uh, excuse me, a conventional boiler, and we'll get into some more detail about that as well. So that begs the question, why not just heat the water to the temperature I need? I mean, why do we have to heat the water up to a high temperature and then mix it down to, to, to cool it off. Um, well, for heating applications, actually you, you can. If you have an electric or a modulating condensing boiler or heat pump, you can just heat the water to the temperature that you need and, and go from there. You don't always have to have uh, a, a mixing valve. However, uh, when we're talking about plumbing applications, and we'll get into that a little bit as well, um, it's, it's not so simple. Uh, you, you can't just heat the water to, uh, to the temperature you need at the tap or the sink uh, because there are health and safety issues, and Bob's an expert on this. So, Bob, why don't you chime in here and talk a little bit about, about the plumbing. Yeah, and it's been a little bit of an up and down with this topic here because for years, and you know, growing up, I remember water heaters, you could set them up to 140, 160 degrees in some cases. And what happened, I guess, back in the 80s and 90s, there started to be um, some concerns about soft tissue lawsuits where people would open a faucet where somebody had left a water heater set up at high temperature. And now, you know, as soon as you get a, a second degree burn and blister the skin, now you've got a liability issue. So what happened over the years, the manufacturers of the, the water heater said, well, wait a second, we don't want to keep going through this 
um, <clears throat> this procedure here with these lawsuits. So they said, why don't we put limiters on our tanks? And what you'll notice is a lot of the tanks now, especially in electric tanks, you can't really set them much over 122 degrees, so they put limiters on them. Well, that went fine for a while, and then what happened is uh, we had a couple cases of Legionella, and I think we're three or four cases now in the U.S. and a number over in Europe, and they said, well, wait a second. If you're going to keep your water temperature that low temperature below 140 degrees, you've got the potential to grow a bacteria in there, which, of course, is an airborne virus, and then somebody takes a shower and inhales that water, and you can uh, you can have an issue with a, a Legionella type of bacteria. So now we're back to, well, then if we're going to elevate the temperature, it's become more critical that we have some kind of mixing device on there that we're not going to ever send that kind of temperature out to the faucets, out to the showers and stuff. So now we're getting back to, all right, what's the best device to do it? How are we going to accurately do that? And it's, it's you know, it's posed a lot of uh, questions, and uh, not all the answers are out there yet because now what's come along is saying, well, if we've got a building, that's got a low temperature uh, domestic water distribution system, we might have to elevate that temperature of that system, you know, once a day for a one hour period above 140 to kill any potential bacteria that's in it and lower it back down. Now what that's going to involve, of course, is a mixing valve that every single faucet in the building, every eye wash station, every shower, every hand sink is going to have to have a protection valve. So good news for you and I, it's going to, you know, make a lot more sales, but you're going to have to be aware of the right type of valve to use in those applications and know that there's going to be some uh, maintenance required, which Kevin's going to talk about. So that's kind of what I know about it. I know uh, a lot of the people out there in different areas of the country probably have different requirements depend on what their authority having jurisdiction uh, wants or likes to see, but that, in a nutshell, that's what's going on is uh, mixing valves are becoming a very critical part of our, our domestic water systems. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So how do they work? Uh, this is a cross-section of a Calefe mixing valve, and <clears throat> basically, yeah, let me get my mouse here, the, the hot inlet uh, water comes in this port and goes through this small opening here into the mixing area uh, where, the, where the shutter is located. The cold water comes in through this port, and here's the thermostat, this gold-colored device down below. That expands and contracts and pushes up and down on a piston, which then moves this shutter up and down to open and close the hot inlet and the cold inlet. So those openings vary proportionally to each other. As one opens, one closes, and vice versa. So then the water just flows through the mixing uh, chamber area all around the thermostatic element and then out the mixed port. So in the Cleffy valves, this uh, particular example, uh, there, the, the mix is always open. The mixed port never closes. So that's, that, that's you know, basically how these valves work. Mm -hmm. So then uh, as, as far as how they work, there's a lot of questions that come up from customers uh, that I've heard on the phone, like what if, uh, what if the pressures in between the hot and cold ports are different? And as we just saw, those, those are right across from each other. So if you get a high ratio, uh, for example, greater than 2 to 1 is a specification on, on our 521 and 5231. Get too much pressure on the hot side, for example, the cold water can't come in the cold port. Um, so you can have uh, flow problems, and the way to, to really get around that is to avoid pumping into the hot port and always try to pump away from the mixed port. And here's a picture you can see. I think you can see here's a mixing valve, and the mixed, mixed port is piped to this circulator, so the water is pulling out the mixing port. Same here. Hot and cold water coming in. The flow comes out the mixing port over to the circulator. And this picture happens to show... Uh, a Calefi hydrolink down below, and you can see that this zone has its own mixing valve, this zone has its own mixing valve, and so does this one. So you could have three different temperatures set here, maybe for you know low temperature, a medium temperature, and a high temperature uh, application. So pump away from the mixing port. That's a good point, Kevin, because I think what happens in some people, in fact, I've seen drawings come out of some of the designers out there that, uh, you know, some of the online designers where they're showing the pump on that return port. But basically what you're looking at there is the delta P that the pump establishes going into the hot port. So if you've got a system that's got a static fill pressure of 12 pounds and you've got a pump on there that's developed an 8 or 10 pound delta P, well, then you've blocked that valve from being able to accurately shuttle back and forth. So always pull through the valve, right? Yeah, that's, that's the guideline. And uh, another common question is, uh, well, what, if, what if my flow is less than the rate of minimum on our specification sheet? For example, uh, like the valve shown in these pictures, has a minimum of 1.3 GPM. And what happens is, is if you have a flow lower than that, then 
the flow profile across the, the cartridge inside can be hot and cold. In other words, the water coming in very slowly in the cold port might come down that side of the thermostat and the hot water might come down the other side. It's not mixing and giving the thermostat a good blended temperature to work with. And so the result is you might have hot or cold slugs of water coming out of the mix port uh, if you have just the flow that's too low. Mm -hmm. and, so the stability uh, so if, of it goes away. Basically. The stability, and, and it may be just fine. Actually, it's hard to predict because it all depends on the piping dynamics, right? It, it might work just fine to a certain point. Uh, it's, yep. it's hard to tell. Um, I mean, if you're getting decent mixing where the cartridge is, then it'll still control. It might hunt a little bit, but it'll still do a decent job. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, what if I have too much flow? Of course, then we're looking at noise, high velocities in the pipe, erosion across the brass uh, and the copper. And the, the control element could also, again, be uh, uh, unstable at, at really high velocities. And I think, Kevin, don't we include, a, a, in some of the valves, we have a chart that shows the pressure drop. Like if you have a valve, for instance, of a 3CB, we'll have a chart that will show you if you're trying to pull you know, 8 or 10 or 12 gallons a minute through there, what that does to the pressure drop. And really, you know, right. a valve could probably handle some of those high flow rates, but if you think about it, if you're putting a three-quarter mixing valve in the system, you're really limited by the pipe size. You're not going to put 10 gallons a minute through a three-quarter copper pipe, so it's not just our valve that's putting some limitations in the flow rate through it with a 3CV valve. You know, we're not going to put much more than, you know, four gallons a minute through a three-quarter copper pipe anyway. So keep in mind, it's right. just not the flow going through the valve. It's the pipe and the fittings and anything else downstream. Every, like that. Everything oh, else, oh, right. Yeah, right. Into the Good point. Thanks. So here's a nice picture um, from uh, Brian Slavinsky. Here's a mixing valve right here. It's a 521, and this is a, this is a great picture because it shows here's the hot water heater, and the hot water is coming into the mixing valve, the cold water. The pump, again, pulling the water through the mix port and then on down to this three-zone system here. Now, you'll notice also that this hot water pipe, uh, there's a nice uh, air and dirt removal device, but that's also going directly to some zones. So here we have a two-temperature system. This is one temperature, probably mixed down to a lower temperature, and these six zones over here are probably a higher temperature. Maybe they're um, some panel radiators or something like that, and maybe this, is, uh, uh, this other one is mixed down for an in-floor application. I like that. I got one of our autofills in that picture, too, so thanks for... Yeah, yeah, that was a great that was a great picture. So we sometimes get the question, what's this spec item about having a minimum temperature difference between a hot water inlet and the mixed water outlet for optimum performance? And what that's really referring to is you, you need to have enough hot water at the hot port to be able to deliver the set point that you have out of your mixed port. In other words, and you're talking if you're hot. There. The, the temperature, right, the, the yeah. hot uh, inlet temperature. If your hot inlet temperature is too close to your setting, then, uh, then, then the thermostat is actually operating really close to the end of its stroke because the hot port is going to be pretty much full open and the cold port will be almost fully closed. And so the thermostat doesn't really have any cold water to work with. So you get much better response and operation if you have a hot temperature that's, that's um, significantly higher than your mix temperature, and the spec on this valve is 27 degrees, so um, that's that's a good guideline, something to keep in mind. And the same thing there, Kevin, I think it doesn't stop working completely if that temperature delta T gets close, it's just the, the stability of the temperature mix starts to go away, because like Kevin said earlier, the temperature going around that sensor isn't uh, you know accurate enough to allow that spool to move up and down and accurately set it. Right, so, right. I think and, and 27 like is what we say. Yeah, 27 is the spec on that valve. And like any control valve, you want to operate within a good throttling range. You, want to don't, you don't want to operate near the end of a stroke of a valve in any kind of a control condition. Mm, good point. So um, we, we get questions about check valves. Um, we, we highly recommend installing the check valves. And in fact, the, the, the uh, point of use mixing valves, the ASSE 1070, which we'll talk about later, they require check valves. But on the, uh, the 521s, uh, you can see the picture here. They'll prevent backflow due to pressure differences. We talked a little bit about pressure differences, and if, if you have uh, too much of a pressure difference, you can actually push water out the inlet port, and you don't want to do that. And also, they'll prevent uh, thermal siphoning. And I wanted to throw in here, too, that uh, the tailpieces are not the same. We get pretty frequent call where someone buys, for example, a 521A valve and not the AC valve, 
and then uh, they say, well, can I just buy the check valve and insert that in? The, the question is, no, you have to get the, the whole tailpiece because it's actually constructed different. This tailpiece right here uh, physically is different from, from the one shown above. So uh -huh. we get that question quite a bit. So um, just a little footnote there. And also on that count, if it's a check valve that uh, has a solder tailpiece, you need to remove the check valve before you solder it so you don't uh, overheat that check right. valve and then you cool right. it off don't and then pop the check in after you're done uh, making your solder connection. Yeah, don't don't solder with those in there. I only have to tear them out and buy a replacement. Okay. So speaking of check valves, <laughs> here's uh, wow. that's a big two inch uh, 5231 mixing valve with the new stainless steel check valve accessories. Um, that's that's a monster. Uh, that's a big monster. So that's, that's an add-on. So that valve you can buy with the tail pieces that go right onto the valve, or if you want to add the check valve, in this case here, it's another center piece, which is that stainless steel spool that you see in there has the check, so they can be added in. Just know that your dimension, of course, changes a little bit. But right. you've got to put you it in the tail piece. It's an optional piece. That's a beautiful, that's a paperweight. Yeah, <laughs> you can get a good workout with that one. But, yeah, sure. those... Stainless check valves are actually male by female, so you just fit them right in between uh, the tailpiece fitting and the valve body. Nice. Yeah. Looks custom. Okay, uh, now let's let's talk a little bit about applications. Um, this is a basic example of, of mixing high temperature boiler supply water. So here we have a conventional boiler with a circulator, and uh, I just have a generic box right here. Let's just call that a generic mixing assembly box. And uh, what we're doing here is, is actually two things. Uh, in this diagram, this mixing assembly is doing, uh, doing is controlling the boiler inlet water temperature. So there would be a mixing valve right here. And it's also controlling the supply temperature out to this low temperature distribution system. And this particular diagram is a little, is a little complicated. But what it's showing is, is sensors in here. So this diagram means that there are controllers involved, and the two motorized mixing valves in this mixing assembly are, are not thermostatic. Uh, and I'll show you some of those later. But because there's a sensor here, that means it's wired to a controller. And this is a motorized mixing valve, and so is this, because there's a sensor out here. So the so boiler, boiler inlet protection. Sorry? Boiler protection so, is what we're trying to provide here so we don't condemn yeah, that. This, yep. So this sensor right here is wired to a controller, which in turn will control the boiler protection, mi boiler protection mixing valve that would be yep. located right here. Okay? This supply yep. temperature sensor here is wired to, a, in this case, a reset controller because we're doing outdoor reset and is controlling the water temperature out to this low temperature distribution system. So just a real brief overview of reset. What that is, is you can increase the temperature of the water going to this low temperature distribution system as the outdoor temperature drops. For example, this is a reset curve. As the outdoor temperature drops from 70 down to minus 10, what you do with the reset controller is you raise that water temperature from 70 up to um, 104 or whatever this is. So as as the outdoor gets colder, you provide warmer water to this low temperature distribution zone. So that, that can only be done with, with an electronic um, uh, reset Operate. controller. Okay. Yep. So the same we can do the same thing here, just like we show with thermostatic mixing valves, uh, but then you don't get reset. And actually, I have a chart that shows that a little little further down. Okay, so taking that a step further, you can do the same thing uh, with two separate systems. Here's a mixing assembly that would serve a higher temperature distribution system. For example, um, you know, maybe um, uh, baseboard radiators or, or something that requires higher temperatures. And you can do another temperature. Like this one shows a medium temperature distribution system. Maybe that's for some panel radiators. So in this assembly, it just takes the last diagram one step further, and you know that then with one conventional boiler, you can serve multiple temperature hydronic systems. And, and uh, you notice, protection. too, there's and, – and still have boiler protection, right. Yeah. In this case, we'd have a boiler protection valve here and a boiler protection mm -hmm. valve here. And they're in – this, in this case, of course, they're both sensing temperature right here going back to the boiler. Mm -hmm. So that shows you can do multiple – 
uh, supply water temperatures. Mm -hmm. And different reset curves on both of them, too. And, and different reset curves, right, when you use electronics. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about uh, boiler protection uh, against sustained flue gas condensation. And let me go ahead and define that for you. So that's, that's um, when common fuels are burned, one of the products of combustion is water. And as long as the temperature in that burn chamber and the flue are, are hot enough, the water you know, is superheated vapor and is carried up up the flue and then you know uh, goes outside. If, however, those metal surfaces you know inside the boiler heat exchanger and the flue are cool enough, what happens is the water vapor will drop below the dew point, uh, its dew point, and then start to condense on the metal surfaces. So that water, when it when it condenses, is mixed with these other products of combustion, and it's really highly corrosive. So what, what that, that will form scaling and it'll pit and corrode the metal in, in the heat exchanger and the burner area and the galvanized vent pipe. So it's bad. Uh, you, you don't want sustained flue gas condensation. Uh, it's going to happen in startup, but you don't, really don't want to, uh, to let that happen for long periods of time. And let me, let me show you kind of how that works. This little diagram right here, when you first start up a wood-fired boiler, um, what the mixing valve does is it bypasses all the water right back to the boiler. So no water goes out to the load. And what this does is it keeps that minimum amount of water circulating as the boiler gets hot uh, until it reaches the temperature setting of this boiler protection valve. And those come with cartridges 115, 130, 140, and 160. So this valve will be in full bypass mode until this temperature right here at the outlet reaches that value of the cartridge. So as the as the uh, as the boiler heats up and the water reaches, let's just say 130, for example, then the valve will start to send some of the water over to the load, and it'll start proportionally bypassing and sending some of the water out to the load, maintaining at least 130 degrees here. And when you get up to 130 plus 18 or 148 degrees at this point then the water is nice and hot, we're not going to have any flue gas condensation, and all the water then is going out to the load. So this valve will proportionally open and close based on the set point of the cartridge plus the 18 degree differential to make sure that we minimize the amount of time that we have um, cool temperatures around that uh, burner and, and the flue, right? Um, and you know what's critical, Kevin, on these wood-fired boilers is you kind of have a double whammy there. Not only do you have the potential for corrosion and stuff, but you have the potential to build creosote, and it happens pretty quickly when you have cold surfaces in there. So that's why this, you know, is developed, you know, specifically for biomass and wood-fired boilers where you get the critical, um, you know, temperature requirement on both the flue gas condensation as well as the creosote. And also what I'd add on this one, because I've got one on my own system that I tried the 281 series, is that not all of the valves that are out there for this um, application shut that uh, bypass off 100%. Some of them always leak through there, but the clubbing one does, in fact, shut that bypass between the, you know, the upper supply of the board and the return back to the mm -hmm. valve off 100%. So when that valve gets up to that temperature, you do have 100% flow going out to the system and, and, of course, returning back. And uh, the other mm -hmm. thing I would say on this here is know that there's an 18-degree differential on that valve. So if it shuts off, you know, that bypass at 140, you've got an 18-degree differential to work with. So what I found on mine is I had to actually step down the size to a 130 because when I add the 18 to it, I get up to the 148. So that's why we have a couple different uh, cartridge selections there to make sure. And really, it's a dew point of the fuel that you're trying to get above, natural gas and oil. You know, they're about the same. You know, some people say 130 degrees and stuff like that. But I would go yeah. a little bit safer with the wood just knowing that you've got the potential for creosote as well as for condensation. Yeah, and we show here is the 280 series. That's the mixing valve only. We have a, a combination uh, circulator and mixing valve there with the gauges. So, uh, whichever one, whichever one you need. And the other beauty of these cabin is they're real high flow valves too. I think was a 14 or 17 CV, so quite a bit more ported out than like the you know the 521 series valve. So if you're doing right. specific boiler protection, this is a better valve than just trying to uh, you know as a high flow. Uh, thermostatic mixing valve. You can't adjust it, of course, but it will uh, you know, have a little bit better flow through it. Exactly. Now here's a really nice picture of some uh, three, looks like three of the uh, 281s with the integral circulators. Yep. 
So um, we talked earlier about that mixing box. Remember the, the, the kind of the generic mixing box. Now here's the, basically the same thing. Uh, we're doing boiler protection and distribution control, this time not with motorized uh, mixing valve, but with thermostatic mixing valve. So you can see here, um, there's, a, there's a mixing valve here. And this is just a schematic, by the way. So the, the valve doesn't actually look like that. And, and the ports are not arranged exactly. We, we looked at that 280 a minute ago. But the, the premise is the same. So we have hot water coming in here. This one would then be manually set, say 130 degrees. Or, or the cartridge uh, might have a 130 degree cartridge. So here we're doing boiler protection. And here we have the mixing valve going out to the low temperature distribution system. I mentioned before, uh, since these are are not electronic, then you don't have a reset schedule. You know, you just have whatever your setting is. Uh, and so that's kind of looking under the hood there. And uh, there's that mixing block I was talking about, right? So uh, that's what it actually looks like inside when you have thermostatic mixing valves. Nice. Now, one word of caution I would throw in here, just from experience with these, is the flow rate of that valve. You know, on our 521 series, we're looking at maybe a 3 CD valve, which means 3 gallons a minute at a 1 PSI drop. So just be aware that if you've got a circuit out there that needs 80,000 BTU or 8, 9 gallons a minute, you know, <laughs> that valve isn't going to be comfortable trying to flow that kind of rate. You're going to need a pretty supersized pump. So just keep an eye on that CV and what you're trying to do with the valve. It's not as critical on the domestic water application. We've got a lot of pressure to drive that uh, through the valve, but when you get a little pump that only develops 6, 8 uh, pounds delta P, you got to make sure that that valve is going to be able to, you know, flow enough to provide your circuit. Because we'll get guys who say, oh, I guess, you know, it's real cold outside. My, my radiant's falling behind. What's going on? Well, yeah. you don't have enough uh, flow through that, um, that valve. Again, that's making sure you pick the right one that has the flow range that you need. Yep. Okay. So also uh, solar applications. Mixing valves are used in solar. Here's a picture of one. Uh, that's used on a Kalefi solar con tank. They're a little different looking. They have the yellow knob. Ours are, um, have the chrome plating on them and a slightly higher temperature rating because solar con tanks, uh, you know, you can run those up pretty hot and you do want to do that and collect as much solar energy as you can and, and keep that tank as hot as you can. Um, so they have a slightly higher temperature rating of 210. It's just another uh, model. It's a 2521 instead of a 521. Otherwise, they're quite similar. Yeah, and, and you know, I've had people say, well, why did you decide on 210 for that? Well, most of the water heaters are going to have a temperature and pressure relief valve on that are set at 210 degrees. So obviously we're not going to see a point where we've got above 210 degree a temperature in the water heater. We're going to pop our uh, the temperature function of the relief valve. So that's why that one goes yeah. up about another 10 degrees. And I think the other one 200 degrees, Kevin, on the standard, and then that goes up to 210 um, on the solar version. Yeah, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's 200. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually it is. It's 200. So here's hey, a picture of, yes. Uh, could you back up this, Mark? A question just came in on that solar application. Uh, and, and Bob, too. Um, this is a single tank application where the backup and the uh, solar tank are all one tank. In the case where you have a two-tank system where you have a separate solar storage tank feeding into your backup, where's the best place to put your mixing valve? Uh, coming off of your second tank or coming off of the solar tank? Yeah, definitely on the second tank, because let's say, for example, this tank here went up to 200 degrees on the solar tank, and you fed into your back of your regular water heater, you're going to feed 200 degrees into that. So we want to protect it at the very last point before it goes out. Again, point of distribution would be the second tank before it goes out to your, your system and your fixtures there. So let it run through this tank and be uh, mixed down at the second tank. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So here's a picture of a solar project. This, this particular one, you can see the mixing valve uh, just in here. It's actually not a solar one, but it's probably used for the, um, the, the, the hydronic side of things. But there's a solar controller and the panels. That looks like a, a great, uh, great place. Is that your cabin, Bob? Yeah. Talk yeah. about location, location, <laughs> location. That's top of the world. Yeah, so that's, that's a combination system there. Okay, a little more on, on mixing valves, manifolds. Uh, Kalefi has manifold mixing stations that come complete. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Right here is the mixing valve. This particular one is a 172 series, and the mixing valve is an integral part of, of the manifold. You can see it's built in here. So the hot water comes in here, the return water comes in this port, and then the pump pulls the water right out of the mixing port 
sending it on out through the, the supply manifold. So uh, these are um, self-contained. It's really nice because it's compact. It's everything you need. Just throw that in a box and, and uh, hook up your uh, supply in uh, your hot and cold, and, and away you go. And this picture happens to have a three-speed pump where, that's also available with a smart pump um, yeah. as, as well. Okay. And um, a great and application for these, Kevin, if I can interrupt again, is uh, yeah. if, like you're doing a big shop and what you would do with this manifold is you send 180 degrees out on a small tube system and then you mix right at the station where you need it. So let's say you've got a big warehouse or a trucking station where you don't want to take inch and quarter, one inch copper out to all these remote manifolds. This allows you to send the higher temperature, obviously the smaller size pipe because we can carry more VTUs at the higher temperature and do your mixing right out at the manifold station. And... Uh, um, I guess you're going to look at that you can do it either motorized or thermostatic. I just wanted to put right. that in there. So That's probably the best application of that is for these big uh, you know, warehouses. Yeah, and the 172 series uh, is, is, um, has the manual, but the 171 series has a motorized mixing valve. So if you want to do reset, just order the 171 series and wire up that mixing valve to a reset controller. Uh, everything else is the same. It's just the different operator on top of that mixing valve. And then it allows you to get the reset curve on because now you're motorized and then you can uh, sense the temperature and adjust the conditions. Right, right. Yeah, and don't right. forget, too, you can order this uh, so that the uh, the tubes go up. You can order this inverted, and our assembly guys will build this so that the tubes go up. So if you're located this in the basement and you have all your the tubing is, is up, then order it inverted. Inverted. Hey, well, I got you. And I know it's a little off of topic here, but what, what about that... Um, Little uh, hydraulic separator fitting in between that, that H valve is that what it, is that always needed or what's the function of that? Because I know we've had some questions on uh, that little uh, separator fitting, and sometimes uh, you want to bypass that or yeah, take it out. Yeah, it's a little, good good point. It's something good to talk about. This little H shaped brass piece right here is a hydraulic separator. So you, it, the hot water can come up, and it, this is open. This is open in between here. So you leave that on if you have another circulator out here. Okay, if you have another circulator out here that's circulating water like a primary loop, uh, okay, primary then, loop yeah. then, then, then this, this provides hydraulic separation between your primary loop and your distribution loop. However, if you're just hooking this up to a tank and there's no circulator out here, you've got to take that out. So just remove that H block and connect your ball valves up right here, and then the, this pump will pull directly out of your tank. But if you hook these up to a tank and leave that H uh, hydraulic separator in there, there's nothing to circulate this water. So this pump will run and run and run. It won't pull any water from the tank because it's just pulling it, sending it out, pulling it right back through here, and, and then yep. on out. So that's that's a little tricky. Um, yep. Make sure that you, you know about that. Good point. Yeah, and when to take it out, when to leave it in. Like you say, if you're connecting that to a primary or secondary loop where you've got a pump that, you know, you can't deadhead the pump. So that's what the separator allows the pump coming off the the primary loop to flow through there, and then you're just kind of pulling your BTs off uh, the other half of that separator via the pump that's on the manifolds. But, yeah, thanks for clearing that up. Right. And I know that question comes in on, gosh, it's not, I'm not getting any heat. What's going on? You say, yeah, you great the question. separator fitting out of it? How'd you pipe it? And that's, uh, it's an easy fix, but it's just, uh, you know, knowing what the function of that device is. Yeah. So leave it in. If you have a circulator out here, take it out if you don't. Okay. Is that really simple enough? Yeah. Another uh, another mixing valve that we have uh, configured with the hydro mixer stations and the hydrolink. This is a really cool product. Uh, it's great for up to what, Bob? About 100,000? Yeah, 100, 110,000 through that because, again, the separator okay. on the left is a limitation. This is a really sweet setup. If you guys haven't tried this, yeah. you want to take a look at this because everything's in a box that you need there. It's a really nice, clean Right, right. Here's the 166 um, series has the motorized actuator if you want to do reset. The 167 has a manual set point on the mixing valve. And, we, and um, well, the, I, let's just switch right over to this picture. So here, let's say we have 160 degree boiler water coming in. There's a little hydraulic separator right in here. So here's our primary loop circulating right here. And so this top chamber has 160 degree water in it. If you have three different temperatures, say you have some in-floor and you want to run it maybe 80 to 110 based on a reset schedule, you can do that here with the mixing valve that's motorized. So here might be your in-floor. And if you might have some other 
uh, heat emitters that you want to send 140 degree water to, we'll put this guy in there and then manually set this to 140. So it'll take this 160 degree water, knock it down to 140 on out to your heat emitters. Now you might have some heat emitters that want the 160 degree water. So in that case, just put a circulator here and, and you know circulate the water right out there uh, to 160 to your heat emitters. And this particular one just has a fourth one down here. So this is called a three by one. So this is a really great way to get multiple temperatures and the mixing valves that you need. Now, do we have a station that's just straight through that doesn't have either of the mixing devices? 165 is Mark or a mic on there. I think um, that we have one more of that if you want to just send out that, like I say, that unregulated yes, temperature, we, like that we, indirect tank or to the high temperature load. I think we've got a station that would match the other two to do that. We do, yeah. And this, um, so this is a prepackaged uh, assembly with the pump, the valve, the temperature gauges. Uh, isolation ball valves, um, you can see those here, and, and there is actually a differential pressure bypass option that you can put in here in between, uh, right, right in this area. Uh, it's yeah. not shown here, but you can put in a differential bypass if you want. And this comes with, shell, with insulated shells, and I'll show you that uh, on the next page. Here's a really good picture of one. It's not completely installed, but you can see the, um, the hydro link down below with the insulation yep. jacket on it, and then two hydro mixers up above. And so if you, you think about this, I mean, look at the labor savings. If you had to build all that with copper pipe and those closely spaced heat and stuff like that, you take these three right. pieces out of the box, mount them on the wall, and with an hour, you could have this thing mounted on the wall. But you got six connections there, and you're up in business. Everything is mixed properly. You've got gauges to set it. you got isolation yeah. to work on and yeah. stuff. This is really a sweet setup. Yeah, it looks great. It makes for a really neat professional installation also. Yep. Here's, another, here's another picture of a Hydrolink 3 plus 1, and I know it's a little bit hard to see, but here are some field-constructed um, connections. There's a circulator. There's a circulator. And uh, actually tucked in there, you, you can hardly see it, but there's a mixing valve right there too. So that zone right there is, is mixing the temperature down to a lower temperature than these other two. Yep. And one other thing on this one, this is an example of an iner inverted manifold where you can see how the loops go up so we can build that with uh, the manifold with the air vents in the right position, obviously, and right. the tubes going up and set it down. That's a really nice uh, demonstration of that. That is a nice picture. And you can see here this one has the um, actuators on it mounted upside down. Those are hermetically sealed, so that's not a problem. Um, and, and those are controlled by, by some zone thermostats. And, and these flow meters can operate upside down. That's not a problem. So yeah, that's a great picture of, in, of inverted. So um, let's talk about how do you, uh, to select the right mixing valve. Uh, really, it boils down to, for, um, for hydronic applications, it boils down to flow. Make sure that the mixing valve has a minimum and a maximum that are going to meet the requirements of your job. Um, you know, besides the connection sizes, of course, you know, get the right tail pieces you need, but really uh, it's the minimum GPM and the maximum GPM that you want to make sure uh, you're going to be able to handle. I think you, you actually uh, physically walked through the testing out on the IAPMO with one of our valves, so you, you saw that it's a really stringent test that you have to pass with these valves, but at, at the very bottom there we're saying the temperature stability. I mean, to meet that code and to get that certification, it's got to be a very accurate plus or, what, plus or minus three degrees, it looks like you're saying there. So. Right. Uh, that yeah. was quite a yeah. quite a thing to see them test that valve and how uh, how strict they are on that on that certification. Yeah, and we talked about what happens when you go below the minimum or above the maximum. So really, it's it's mm -hmm. all about making sure you have the the valve that's going to handle the GPM for your project. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, once in a while, uh, we have a requirement, and we do get calls on this. You know, we we talked about. Let me just show you again, real quick. So this valve right here might have a 4.4 to 40 GPM range. Um, what if you have a project that really needs like 1 to 50 GPM? Well, we get that call. And um, uh, sometimes it's referred to as a high-low. And what you can do, and here's a couple of pictures, is you can actually pipe mixing valves in parallel. This picture here shows uh, a large, this is a 5231 valve, and then behind it, it's a little hard to see, is a 521, and they're piped in parallel, and there is a PRV piped to the mixed outlet of the big valve. And what that does, and this, this is the same, this is another project, actually was in a restroom in, a, in an airport, if I'm not mistaken, but you can see there's a small 
mixing valve here and a larger mixing valve. And just briefly, the way that works is once the pressure in the supply line going out drops to a certain point, at the point at which this valve is completely maxed out, it can't flow any more water, the pressure here will drop to the point, and that at that point is where you set this PRV to open up. So the PRV is normally closed while this valve is, is uh, controlling the flow. And then when it becomes co completely uh, starved or unable to, to deliver the water, this will open up and then you'll get flow through the big mixing valve. So it's, it's, a, it's um, you know, small uh, and, uh, and a large one kind of staged, if, if you will. And now, this yeah, little bit of work, I, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's a little bit of work to set up. Um, you, you mean you have to play around with this. It really depends on, on your system. But we do see customers doing that, and it is one solution. Uh, but, Bob, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, the application would be for this, let's say you've got a, maybe an airport or something like that where you've got a bunch of hand sinks, and maybe there's 100 hand sinks in the O'Hara airport. If somebody opens one faucet and they've got a, what, half GPM flow or something like that, obviously with that big two-inch valve or whatever that might be in the picture there, you're not going to be able to regulate that temperature accurately because you don't have enough flow to get that stability at that low flow rate. So that's where we need the ability to regulate down at the very lowest flow that you can expect going through the other one. And then, of course, if everybody opens the hot water faucet at once in the airport, you've yeah. got to be able to supply that demand too. So yeah. I guess the only thing I would do there is uh, ignore the color of the handle on that one valve. But other than that, yeah. it's a great, uh, but we're looking a at great this. Uh, look at it. Yeah, we, we don't currently have a, a better solution than this, but we are definitely looking at it. There are companies that do make uh, high-low mixing valves. So I just wanted to throw this in here because it does come up from time to time. Yeah, even on big homes, and, we can run into that where they've got big body spray showers or something like that, and they want right. a 12, 15 gallon a minute flow, so they they select a valve that can you know handle that, and they say, oh gosh, we're getting kind of thready water temperatures when we just open the uh, the hand sink down in the lab, and yeah. that's the issue. They don't have the the resolution on the high end and the low end because the one valve just it, I don't think you can make a valve a thermostatic valve that can do that. I mean, it's just not possible to make a valve that can be accurate at a half GPM and at, say, you know, 20 or 40 gallon a minute flow. Yeah, and then maybe a motorized tough. valve could do that. I know you've got some experience with motorized. Maybe that's another option. But uh, really, the thermostatic is the go-to valve for this type of application where you're trying to accurately yeah. mix and, you know, and it's a supportable valve. And it does have a wide range of uh, uses, both on, you know, domestic water and radiant. But just know the limitations and when you have to, uh, you know, Look at a dual right. valve setup or something like that. Right. So switching gears just a little bit again, uh, let's let's talk about selecting the right mixing valve for plumbing applications. Really, the the first thing to consider here is where is it going to be installed? Okay, is it going to be installed near the hot water source, like an indirect water heater? If it is, uh, that's called a point of distribution valve, and and th those valves are going to have an ASSE 1017 rating. Um, that's a standard that uh, that a, a point of distribution valve has to has to meet if if uh, someone wants to market their valve as as an ASSE approved valve. So that's one location. If the mixing valve is going to be located at a, at the point of use out by a fixture or a, a sink or a la you know laboratory or a shower, that is actually uh, tested to a different standard called ASSE 1070. So those valves have some special functions, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but um, they are anti-scald valves. That's another term for an ASSE 1070 valve. It's an anti-scald valve to protect um, from burning a person's skin. And, Kevin, could they be used in conjunction with one another? Could you have a point distribution? Let's say you've got that water heater set at 160 degrees, and you want to just temper it down, and then you'd add a secondary valve at the, to make sure that you're not going too high at your fixture. Do they get used together sometimes? Yeah, yeah, they, they do. And, and there are uh, instances where you want to have both. In fact, um, ASSE 1017, the actual standard, let me just read a quote here. It, it says, this class of valve, uh, ASSE 1017, is intended to be installed at the hot water source. These devices are designed for primary automatic control of the hot water distribution temperature within a reasonable degree of uniformity. And it goes mm -hmm. on to say, to provide final temperature control, ASSE 1017 devices should be supplemented by a point of use device or an inline device designed to control final temperature. So even ASSE is saying, yes, uh, you know, in, in cases, there are cases where you want both. So, yep. uh, for example, 
Um, if you had a project where you had laundry or dishwashing needs, or you might have temperatures of, you know, maybe you need 140 or, or 150 degree temperatures for laundry or dishwashing, and then maybe in that same facility you have some showers or tubs or sinks, then that's when you, you know, might use both. You would use the uh, point of distribution valve and a point of uh, point of use valve, uh, you know, to protect for the showers and tubs and faucets. Because the ASSE 1017 valve does not provide that scald protection, so that the one that's located near the heat source does not provide that safety. Um, okay. In fact, it can be set up to like 150 degrees. So there are cases when you would have both, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, let's hear some special information about the 5213. This is the Kalefi point of use valve. It has some stringent requirements. Uh, it, it prevents the flow of water discharging from the mixed outlet. Well, you can read that in, in the event of failure. So that's one of the special functions about an ASSE 1070 valve is that it will shut off and, and you know, as, as a safety feature. Uh, it has some different specifications, too. The differentials are different, uh, and it goes down to 0.5 GPM. So that one, being a point of use valve, it has to go down really low, and uh, half a GPM is the minimum on that. So that's the smallest mixing valve. Uh, that we have in terms of CV. And that one is chrome plated because typically it could be in an application where you'd see it like that under a sink or something like that, so it looks a little bit nicer to have a plate. Yeah, it just and looks also, a little I nicer. On, yeah. yeah, and that one you need a tool to adjust it too. You can't, somebody couldn't just reach under that sink at the at the airport and just start changing water temperature. It's got to have a, uh, I guess in our, our cap of our valve there, you take that off and the wrench is actually molded into the handle that you adjust okay. it and you snap it and locks it. Okay, yeah. So it's it's a slightly uh, differentiated valve compared to the others. And so now this is a webinar in itself. I just wanted to touch on recirculation, but um, this is one application where you use an ASSE 1017 valve uh, to provide hot water uh, recirculation. It's very popular. There's a lot of discussion on this topic, and I wanted to just touch on it, but um, not get into too much detail because we have... Um, Hydronics uh, number 11 gets into detail on that, and we also actually have a, an entire webinar. So if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of recirculation, I uh, want to direct you to that uh, July 2011 Coffee with Kalefi webinar. It's in our archive files, so go take a look at that. And uh, one, of the, one of the main or the key uh, points ab about this is how to set it up and how to get it uh, um, adjusted so you don't have recirculation creep. And that, what that is, is it's, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if your cold water inlet on your mixing valve starts to warm up, um, if you don't have the valves adjusted right, that you don't always have cold water here. And what can happen is that cold water will creep up and get warmer and warmer and warmer, and eventually the cold water isn't cold anymore. It's hot. So you have hot and hot and hot. So eventually your recirculation line will, will get uh way too hot and um, you don't want to do that so there's a special way to set that up. Any, anything uh, about this Bob that you want to cover without getting yeah, into I too much really, detail? Yeah, now quickly I think what you're showing there is that once you start losing that 27 degree differential between your hot and your mix and that's what we're trying to show with the color of the arrows there, once that starts right. to drop below that you lose the stability of that valve, and you've got the potential for that valve. The first person up in the morning opens a hot water faucet, they could get whatever's coming out of that water heater of 140, 150 degrees. So you got to really pay attention when you start blending uh, research pumps with these thermostatic mixing valves. And I know we've got a couple good schematics that I think they're included in the box with the valve on the right way to pipe that to balance it out. But, yeah, we did that webinar, as you said, in 11. It's, I know it's in our archive, and Julius Blanco is an engineer that does a lot of forensic work. When there's soft tissue lawsuits, he gets called in to find out what happened and why. Yeah. And he did a great job of explaining this, and it's hard to do in just a couple slides here. I know we're getting to the end of the, yeah. the show here, but I would highly recommend people that are involved either specifying this type of valve or out there troubleshooting or installing these valves. You really, really need to pay attention to that because you don't want to be involved in one of these issues where somebody gets, uh, you know, potentially burned in a in a job right. that you that you touched or installed or yeah. specified. So thanks for clearing yeah. that up. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So let's just cover a few installation do's and don'ts. These are just tidbits um, that are worth mentioning. Uh, there are no restrictions on mounting orientation. We get that call sometimes. Can I mount it upside down? Can I mount it on its side? No problem. No restrictions. We already talked about this. 
pump away from the mix port, so make sure you set your piping up that way. Uh, we touched on this too. Uh, solder the sweat tail pieces to the piping before you install the plastic checks. Those will melt. If that happens, you have to pull them out. They're, they're basically destroyed, but you can buy a replacement for a few bucks and put it back in, but save yourself the headache and don't, don't put those in the tail pieces until you're ready. Um, Bob did a little tech tip on this a while back. Those green fiber washers that are used uh, on these union nuts, they seal much better if you just get them a little bit wet before you install them. It, it just, um, I don't know what it does, Bob. It activates that glue a little bit, and then they, they, uh, they shouldn't leak if you get them wet before you install them. It's just a you know, precaution. And know that when you take one apart, they're going to rip most times. Because what they'll do is they'll stick to both surfaces, to the valve and to the tailpiece. And when you disassemble, yeah. most of the time they rip in half. And you're going to take like a, your pocket knife or a little uh, sandpaper or a little file or something. Clean it off because you've got to get all that off the two brass surfaces and then put a new fiber washer in there. So make sure when you're going out to do a service call that you've got some extra washers with because rarely can you reuse them uh, successfully yeah. anyways. Yeah, and it's a good idea to keep some of those on hand. Mm -hmm. Verify the setting with a thermometer. Um, we, we offer this valve with a temperature gauge, like you can see in that picture. Um, but, but verify with a thermometer. The, the numbers on the dial are a guideline. So you can see here, one, two, three, uh, through seven. Those are a guideline that will get you in the neighborhood of the temperature you need. But still, you need to verify that with a thermometer because uh, the, the hot temperature and the cold temperature coming to your valve are not always going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, as this particular table was um, uh, set up to, to, to match. A uh, little bit of maintenance and troubleshooting. We get this question, my valve won't deliver enough hot water. What's, what's going on? Or excuse me, it won't deliver hot enough water. Um, verify first, of course, that your hot inlet is hot enough. Remember we talked about that 27 degrees difference, at least that's on the, the 521 and 5231. So first of all, make sure you've got that available. And uh, it's, it's very common once these are installed for a while or even new installations that some dirt or debris uh, gets, gets stuck in that shuttle. Uh, on a new project, you might flush some Teflon tape or, or some um, copper shavings or something into the pipe and, and get lodged in there. You can turn, the, turn that knob to see if it's smooth. If it feels rough or it's sticking, then you know something's lodged in there. Uh, but really the, uh, the most common issue is, is dirt. So if, uh, if the valve is delivering hot and cold slugs, could be the same thing. Uh, could be dirt and debris, or if your flow is lower than the specified minimum. Remember, we talked about that as well. So make sure your flow is above the minimum rating for the valve. And um, another question that comes in kind of related to uh, troubleshooting is, can your 521 be used with instantaneous domestic hot water heaters? There's actually a note in, in our literature that cautions against that. And Bob, I'll let you talk about this, but isn't it really that um, some domestic hot water heaters will trip on low flow? Yeah, there's a couple different issues with a, a tankless type of water heaters depending on how the, the, the unit is being fired. It's, they can actually kind of fight each other. Like the, you know, the unit's trying to rev up its temperature because it sees flow going out and the valve is trying to mix it down and it's not always a successful uh, application of putting a, uh, you know, a mixing valve on a tankless heater. It really depends on the type of tankless heater. Mm -hmm. What you're finding out there now with a lot of the tankless manufacturers, they're, they're addressing two problems. There's number one, uh, what's called the cold sandwich, and they're starting to put a little bit of a flash tank in the tankless heaters with them, so you've got maybe a gallon or two capacity in there so you don't get that you know, hot, cold slugging where the thing ramps up and it shuts off quickly, and that's going to make a big difference in the way our valves perform. If you've got a tankless heater that's got one of those little flash tanks in it, they're going to behave just fine, but we have had issues trying to get them to behave properly when you've got a tankless heater that just revs up and down quickly, and okay. it's like the, you know, the response time of the, the valve doesn't match the response time of the tankless, and they're, again, they kind of fight each other, so just pay attention to that. And if I could one, add one other thing here too, Kevin, is... Oh. Some of the uh, guys, especially our solar installers, will buy two of our gauge tail pieces, and they'll put one on the hot port and one on the mixed temperature, so that when, when they go and pull a valve, they can see what the temperature from the hot is coming into the valve, and then they'll know, well, gosh, it's only 15 degrees. Well, then you're going to have to raise the temperature of your whatever water is coming from your solar preheat or something like that, or the valve's yeah. not going to mix accurately. So a good you know, suggestion is sometimes buy the additional gauge tail piece and put it on your hot side and you can see exactly... And then when you call us, we can say, well, what's the temperature coming in? You have to say, well, it's 120, and you're trying to miss 115. Guess what? 
it's not going to Yeah, it's good, good point. It's a good point. So then if you get to the point where your valve looks like this, uh, mm. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, um, that's, that's too far gone. Uh, you could try and remove it and soak it in a bucket of some kind of um, lime away or CLR or something like that, or mm. even vinegar as a home solution. Um, to keep it clean, and, and we do recommend that if you if you see that um, you're getting some buildup in there. Of course, mineral deposits are more severe with extremely hot water, so you want to keep an eye on that. If you get to that point, though, uh, the way to to remedy is to replace the body assembly. So here's a picture, two pictures. So what we sell is the body assembly. Uh, you just uh, under the unions, pull the old body out, put this one in, put your new washers in, and away you go. So you don't have to take it apart, get inside, and, and spend all that uh, service technician time trying to replace a cartridge. Just replace the whole body. That's our solution. Yeah, and what, if I could offer one suggestion that would make your life a lot easier is every time you put in a thermostatic mixing valve, put a valve on all three ports of it. So if you do have to go out to a job, especially a job like a big commercial building where you don't want to shut off the water, even for you know a half hour to take that valve, you know, scrape the gaskets off, replace it. Yeah. Having good isolations, good quality valves, shut it off, quickly take it out, have another spare with you, just take it, switch it out, take the other one home. If it's not too bad, soak it overnight. You can reuse it again, take it out to the next job. But if it looks as bad as that last picture, I'm pretty sure it didn't leave the factory <laughs> looking like that. So that's obviously, you know, from the quality of the water that's been going through it. So just know that yeah. this is going to be a, a maintenance item for you. Yeah. And uh, just, just to finish up quickly, I just want to remind you of a couple things. There's that gauge adapter that Bob talked about that's available separately. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember that our 521 and 5231 are low lead certified, so that means that valve or those valves can be used for hydronic or potable. And by the way, Kalefi was a pioneer uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the early days when low lead became law, so those valves uh, have been out there for a while. And don't forget about the adjustment knobs. And uh, we don't need to go into detail here, but we've got some other information that show you how to set and lock those adjustment knobs to prevent the rent tampering. So um, we're a little bit uh, behind, so I want to scoot and uh, go ahead and move on um, to the next slides. So I'm going to turn it back over to Bob to, to wrap up. Thanks, everybody. Well, yeah, and you did a great job. And I know I think, of course, stay in touch with us, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, However you like to communicate, we love to hear from you, good or bad. So uh, keep in touch. and. Uh